Welcome back to the Detect Crime series webinar presented by Serialize. In each episode, we examine one specific aspect of how crime series work, with a little help from the excellent scholars of the Detect project, practitioners from the field, and our Serialize instructors. Last week, we looked at the classic crime procedural. In today's episode, we take a look at its close cousin, the investigative thriller. The investigative thriller turns the weekly case into a season-long pursuit. Here, we no longer have the resolution of a single case within the span of one episode. Rather, the murder that is discovered in episode one triggers an investigation that spans across many episodes and hours. How does the investigative thriller manage to keep our interest over such a prolonged period of time? Here again, we need to take a good look at the story engine. How does a single homicide generate enough story to fill a minimum of six to 10 episodes? I'll let you in on a secret. It's not about the murder. It's about the characters. First, let me clarify what I mean by investigative thriller. In many ways, the template for this kind of show was laid by the US series Twin Peaks in 1990. Yet the Scandinavian noir series, with their shorter season spans than traditional American network shows, have been most adept at refining this subgenre over the last 15 years. Most notable examples include Denmark's The Killing, Follow the Money, and more recently DNA, the Danish-Swedish co-production The Bridge, Norway's Mammon, Iceland's Trapped, and Sweden's Jordskot. British variations on the genre include Broadchurch, Machella, and the Swedish-UK co-production Young Wallander. US networks have tried their hand on adapting shows such as The Killing, but they found more commercial and critical success with anthology series like True Detective or American Crime. Of course, the main difference to the standard police procedural is that the investigative thriller is serialized. The storyline ex extends across multiple episodes. The initial murder case won't be solved until the very last episode of the season. But in many ways, the investigative thriller follows a similar pattern as the classic police procedural. The investigators follow the leads, interview suspects, and try to solve the mystery of who killed the victim. The plot mechanics simply occur on a much more elaborate scale. There are more suspects with more complex backstories that can be explored. And as in the classic police procedural, our detectives won't know the true identity of the killer until the final climax. In fact, our heroes are fighting against an unknown antagonist who keeps throwing up new obstacles. For the killer does not simply wait for the investigators to discover him or her. As the detectives solve the clues, the antagonist will attempt to thwart their progress by, for instance, damaging or stealing evidence or killing potentially more witnesses. For the writer, this is useful because it raises the stakes for our protagonists. Now, it's not only a matter of solving one case and restoring justice, but even more urgently to prevent further crimes and protect the innocent. Increasing stakes and fighting against an unknown antagonist also raises our curiosity as viewers and propels us to stick with the series. The serialized storyline requires a dedicated viewership that follows the unfolding of the case until the very end. Yet the investigative thriller is not merely about solving a single crime. Maintaining the viewer's curiosity for the killer over the span of six or ten episodes is a big task for a writer. So how do you do that? I asked producer Philip Steffens, who made the thriller series Weinbach, The Valley, how writers should approach this task. Be quite honest, for me, in, yes, in, in storylining, obviously you think about, um, and you have to do this much more in the in the six, eight, ten episode um, uh, one case story arc, you have to directly outline much more the different characters and um, and, and 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 the twists and turns uh, for the entire series. Uh, that's natural, but uh, and you also have to figure out if you have enough. Uh, you know, story arcs and, and characters uh, for, for that kind of storytelling. That said, you still will have sort of problems of the week. You might have the case that is the, the big one, but you will have steps every week that you get through to your, to the end. You, so, so there are arcs within each episode even from a serialized show, it's it's just the big case. It's not over yet. 
it, it show never even the serialized show never ends like abrupt like there's still like some arcs that then get you hooked or some things that reveal itself and then you you go you know there, there's still arcs that motivate you to watch a serialized show each episode up until the very end so the real plot engine of the investigative thriller is not simply the solving of the initial crime rather like the peeling of an onion the investigative thriller reveals layer by layer new secrets and potentially more crimes. What thrillers like Weinberg have done so well is in opening up new branches of storytelling within the overall arc of the main investigation. The original case and the hunting for that murderer is therefore only the main line. With each episode, the main line opens up into a new branch of story that reveals a different unlawful or unethical practice by one of the characters that populate the show. This offense may or may not be linked to the original crime, but what it shows us is that no character is what they seem. Whereas the detective of the classic police procedural never really changes and remains fairly unaffected by the cases of the week, the protagonist of the investigative thriller does not. As the protagonist gets closer to the central mystery, the stakes become increasingly more personal. The, the antagonist may start to threaten the protagonist or those she or he holds dear. We see this occur in The Bridge. In season one, Martin Rode is the police detective from Copenhagen PD, assigned to investigate, along with his Swedish colleague, Sagan Oren, a mysterious homicide found on the bridge connecting Denmark with Sweden. For most of the season, Martin's family life plays along as a counterpoint to the formal investigation. Martin has to deal with his estranged son, August, who has moved back in with Martin and his second wife and young children. August's presence and his obstinate behavior towards his father put a strain on Martin's marriage life. It is through Saga, who strikes up an unexpected friendship with a young man, that August starts to thaw and find a way to connect again with his father. But right at that moment, the killer strikes again and now threatens Martin's newly regained relationship with his son. For Martin, the case is no longer simply about catching a bad guy and restoring justice. Now he has, he has to protect those people most dear to him. Writer and producer Nicola Luzuardi, a frequent guest on the show, puts it this way. The nuance that we call thriller is always about uh, the personal price that an, inv an investigator pays uh, in uh, prosecuting the evil. As the protagonist delves deeper and deeper into the criminal world, the crime itself begins to contaminate the hero. In his or her obsession to solve the case, the investigator is forced to cross legal and ethical lines that put his or her own moral legitimacy at risk. What we call thriller is, is about uh, how, how long can you psychologically, because it's mostly psychological, you know, your, your psychic mm -hmm. integrity, how long can you stand to be in, in connection with the hunting, the evil, being provoked by the evil. In the final confrontation with the antagonist, the protagonist must then decide how far is she or he willing to go. In the climactic scene of the bridge, the killer provokes Martin to pull a gun in, on him and shoot him. At this moment, the detective and the killer are not that much different. All it takes is for Martin to pull the trigger and he becomes the same as the killer. But the contamination comes from make you, investigator, experience that you are, you are not so different from him. Mm. He closed the distance. And so, the, the, the counter team, the antagonist, the counter thematical point of view, the um, team, counter team, the counter thematical point of view of the antagonist is essential because as to challenge a bit the strength of uh, the investigator. In the final count, what differentiates the hero from the antagonist? What act will effectively save him or her from becoming the same as the antagonist? It is in fact Saga, the other half of the hero pairing, who saves Martin from himself. She commits the biggest sin in her book, She Lies, in order to stop Martin from stooping to the killer's level. For one of the major themes of the investigative thriller is the insidiousness of crime. Whereas the classic police procedural tells us that no man or woman is above the law, in that, the investigative thriller tells us that no one is without sin.
The plot mechanics of the investigation and character development work in lockstep to lead us to this question, what is a story really about? What do the TV makers want to say with this work? For in order to capture us as viewers, the mystery must reveal something fundamental about human existence. The UK series Broadchurch is a great example of format and character working hand in hand to say something profound. In the pilot, the body of 11-year-old Danny Latimer is found on the beach of the small seaside town of Broadchurch on the Jurassic Coast. Local Detective Sergeant Ellie Miller and her new boss, Detective Inspector Alex Hardy, a transfer from out of town, declare the investigation a homicide when it turns out that the boy was strangled before being thrown off a cliff. D.S. Miller, who has spent her entire life in this town, believes that the perpetrator must be an outsider. However, D.I. Hardy chides her for her naivete and tells her that any bandit in a town could be a suspect. Miller responds that she's known these people all her life. This argument between the two characters becomes the guiding narrative principle of the show. Because as Hardy and Miller follow the clues, they realize that many of the townspeople indeed have something to hide. Each episode brings forward a new suspect in the murder case and shows the repercussions on their personal lives. The show clearly says that no one is without sin, but while the suspect anybody mantra is a sign of good police work, it is also detrimental to the community. As more suspects are hauled in front of the police, mutual suspicion takes hold and breaks down the texture of society. This goes so far that when one potential suspect is revealed to have, sex, have had sex with a minor in the past, a lynch mob gathers to take justice into its own hands. The investigation of Danny's murder is only the trigger that sets off these events. Even though ostensibly the show is about finding the murderer, the story engine feeding the individual episodes is really the unraveling of secrets that all these char characters have been harboring along the way. So the show is really about the destructive power of suspicion, which can bring an entire community to its knees. That is not to say that D.I. Hardy's mantra is wrong. Diaz Miller has the biggest character arc to travel because she must realize that it was her own husband who killed Danny. The crime was closer to her than she ever imagined. She's not without blame either because her steadfast refusal to suspect those around her allowed the killer to walk freely for longer than he should have. Broadchurch does a masterful job in utilizing the elements of a thriller to tell an engaging character drama. Because in the end, the story will only be meaningful to an audience if the crime affects the main characters in a profound way.